All right. So where we left it was with this beautiful picture of our hands lifted high, being totally, fully submitted to Jesus Christ, being one kingdom people, right? Stewards of everything, right? So how many of you today, as you sit here, are living fully into that picture? Okay, good. They're all honest. We have honest people here. It's not good to lie at a seminary. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you're all good and honest in all of that. Because um, I'm not. That's not, that's not a, a good picture of my reality on a day-to-day -day basis. I wish it was, but it's not. And the, second, the question we need to understand in the second part of building this theological foundation is why not? What happens to us? What is the battle that we're in that keeps us from living this life? What we talked about in the first session was the second half of John 10.10. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And that we just talked about what that looked like, didn't we? Fully surrendered, steward of all parts of life. But now we've got to take seriously the first half of John 10.10, 10, that the enemy comes to kill and steal and destroy. Because the Bible didn't end at Genesis chapter 2. We wish it did, but Genesis chapter 3 came. And so we have to take seriously this understanding of the temptation that happened in the garden. I've done quite a bit of work of theological biblical work and reflecting on Genesis 2 and 3 uh, and it is just packed. You know it's such a short little story. When we hear it in Sunday school it kind of goes quickly. Eve comes to the tree, enemy comes, says don't you want to eat of it? She says yes, she eats it, the fall comes and we're off and running in Genesis chapter 4. Wow, there's a lot in three, a lot in three. And so I'm gonna to try to unpack a little of it for you so that you can see the importance of, of just how this whole story unfolds. <clears throat> so for some reason, Eve was at the tree. Now, there's a, there's a couple of sermons in why Eve was at the tree, right? Why was she even close to it? Why did she even come near to it? When God gives him the entire garden and says, you can have everything and anything and everything is fabulous and wonderful and every one of your needs are met, you see that tree way over there? Just stay away from it. But everything else is yours. Why in the world would you go near it? But Genesis 3 finds Eve at the tree. You don't get a sense that this is the first time or that she got lost and all of a sudden she was geocaching and all of a sudden found herself where she didn't think she was and all of a sudden by the tree. No. Something was happening there. Maybe she and Adam were being kind of lured to it. Maybe over time they got a little closer to it. For whatever reason that might be there, she found herself at the tree. She put herself and Adam in a place of temptation, in a sense. So, you guys that are pastors, you people that are pastors, just ruminate on that and preach on it. It's a great text to think about why was Eve even at the tree. Wouldn't it have been a lot harder if the enemy would have said, you see that tree way over there? Binoculars? Yeah, that's, uh, that's that tree. No, you know, she wouldn't, she wouldn't have taken a 20 minute trek to go eat of the forbidden fruit. It was right there. It was right there. So how did she get there? Another story, another sermon. Um, but in any event, we find her at the tree. And the enemy comes along. And if you think about the this theologically for a moment, if, if for whatever reason God gave the enemy access to his beautiful, perfect creation one time, kind of gave him one shot, think how carefully the enemy must have calculated exactly what he would say. This wasn't off the cuff. This wasn't like all of a sudden he was there and he goes, oh, oh gosh, well, let's see, Eve, let's see, how about, uh, no, he, he had thought this through carefully. This was his one opportunity to bring down the kingdom of God, to undo what God did in creation, to bring in the whole history of, of humanity's sinfulness. And so he chooses his words incredibly carefully. And that's another thing that I never really realized. When I read this story, I just thought it was kind of a chance encounter. Um, but no, this was, this was it. This is the moment. So what do we learn from the careful calculation of the words of the enemy to Eve? To set the scene, remember, when God created the world, he put Adam and Eve in the world, and he basically said to them, listen to this now, 
everything you need for your good, I have created for you. Everything that you need for your good, I have created for you. There is nothing else you need. It's all here. I know you. I created you. I love you. I've supplied all of your needs. Your perfect happiness has been my greatest joy. And everything you need is here. The only thing I require is that you trust me, right? Just trust me. Because remember, they didn't know good from evil. They weren't able to step back and say, well, now, I don't know, this is kind of good, you didn't give us that, that's kind of good, you didn't give us that. They didn't know good from evil. And so all that was required of them was just to trust that the God who created them gave them everything they needed. And as long as they lived into that trust of this wonderful, loving, abundant God, life was Garden of Eden. It was paradise, right? So what is the enemy going to do in the midst of trying to talk to Eve when God has given them everything? She has no need. There's nothing wrong. She's not hurting. There's no pain. There's nothing. It's, everything is perfect. What in the world does the enemy say that's going to dissuade anybody from not continuing to live that way? Pretty tough, pretty tough challenge, isn't it? Well, this is why he's the father of lies. Because the first thing he does, he comes along <clears throat> And he says, we know, we know the story, don't we, from childhood. Did God really say that you can't eat of any of the fruit in this whole garden? Well, it's preposterous, right? And Eve says, oh, no. No, of course not. We can, we can eat of any of the fruit in the entire garden. It's all ours. She might have gone on and on about how wonderful fruit and vegetables and everything in here is all for our pleasure. We can eat of everything in the garden except this tree. We can't eat of that. Because if we eat of that, or even touch it, well, we're going to die. So why would he ask her that question? He knew the answer, right? The enemy never asks us a question. He doesn't already know the answer. So he wants us to think about something. Well, here's my, here's my uh, I guess, silly little brain trying to wrap myself around this. But imagine that maybe that Eve, after she answered the enemy, and we know in Scripture this kind of comes boom, 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 but maybe it didn't. Maybe he asked her the first question and went away for a couple days. And a couple days later, he meets her again, and she's had a chance to think about this. I wonder sometimes how much time passed between these three statements. Because at the end of the first one, I can imagine Eve, after she said this wonderful declaration, we need of anything in the garden except this one, if the enemy gave her a little time to think about it, and she said, hmm, I wonder why. I wonder why. Why would God create this great garden for us, tell us that we had everything we needed, and then forbid us to eat of this tree. Why would he do that? Why would a loving, just God keep something from us? You hear this? Suddenly, the enemy got her to focus on the fact that God was saying no someplace, that God was holding something back, that God was forbidding her and them to have access to this one tree. Why would God do that? Why would a just and loving God allow things to happen? That sound familiar? Isn't that the question we get asked a lot by non-believers and even by people that are struggling with their faith? Why would a just and loving God allow my child to die? Why would a just and loving God allow pain to happen in this world? I've been praying for 30 years for this to happen. Why would a just and loving God not answer my prayer? Why, why, why? Well, I think that's the question that the enemy put in Eve's mind. Why would he do this? It makes no sense. Why would he keep something from us? And maybe, just maybe, she began to wonder, well, is, I mean, is God really completely good if he's keeping something from us? To me, that's kind of a natural question. I've been trusting the goodness of this God, and now this good God, all of a sudden the enemy just reminded me, well, he's mostly good, but is he really all good if he puts something right in front of me which has beautiful fruit and says, no, you can't have it? Maybe a little question, maybe a little hesitation. Maybe for the first time in eternity, and again, when I read this, it's kind of like he creates them and the next day they fall. Well, doesn't have to be the case, does it? It could have been a thousand years they could have lived in Eden. But somehow in their entire time together, 
This moment comes and she has to think about something she's never thought about before. Why would he do that? Maybe he's not really fully good. At least how I understood it. And then the enemy says, hmm, okay. So he said to you that you'll die if you eat of this tree. Well, let me tell you something, Eve. You won't die, right? The enemy says, you won't die, which is basically saying God lied to you. Right? God lied to you. He told you you were going to die. No, God's a liar. You won't die. In fact, something marvelous is going to happen. If you eat of that tree, your eyes will be opened. Now, if you come to somebody and say, if you read my book, your eyes will be opened, what's it implying? That they're blind, right? That their eyes are closed, that there's something important that they don't see. And all of a sudden, Eve had to consider that, well, what don't, what don't I see? If my eyes will be open, that means that now my eyes are shut. What, what would I see? What am I missing? What am I missing? What is God keeping from me that if I eat of that tree, I'll be able to see? What does it mean to know good from evil? Maybe that's something I should do. What is God keeping from me? And I believe what this was, was exchanging a trust in God for a trust in myself. Maybe I need to take action to do something that God is not doing for me. Do you see that? Because if I just trust God, I'll say, no, nope, don't need it. I trust him, he's good, he's trustworthy. Um, I can live without the tree very much, thank you. But now she's saying, maybe there's something here I want for myself. Maybe I need to take control. Maybe I need to take action in violation of God's law because he can't really be trusted with everything. So now the enemy has got her thinking about goodness and trust. And when you undermine the goodness of God and absolute trust in God, you've walked a long ways down the road of temptation, haven't you? A long ways down the road. And he's got her set up for the final, the final one. And he said, not only will your eyes be opened, Eve, but he makes the most single, most audacious statement in all of Scripture. I mean, absolutely the most audacious statement statement in all of scripture. What does he say will happen if she eats of the fruit of the tree? You will be like God. You will be like God. Oh my goodness. This is better than I even thought. I don't have to now be under the rule of God. I can be like God. I can be an equal to God. And it's just waiting right there, that piece of fruit. And remember now, I'm not so sure I can trust God as much as I thought I did. I'm not sure he's as good as I thought he was. So why not be like God? What a huge offer. How many things are happening in our world today where people are being offered a chance to control their lives like they're God of their own life? That is a, I want to talk about that here in just a minute. I won't go too far down that road. But when he said you will be like God, I believe what we see happen here is what we call the rise of a second kingdom the rise of a second kingdom. So Eve takes the fruit and she eats. And her eyes are opened. He was right, wasn't he? Her eyes were opened. And she will know, and she did know right from wrong. And she gave it to Adam and his eyes were opened. And he did know right from wrong. And in some sense, they were elevated to a level that was almost godlike. The problem was, is that when God knows right from wrong, he always chooses the right and rejects the wrong. When we know right from wrong, we reject the right and we go down the path of the wrong because we're not divine. Well, if all of a sudden you find yourself in a position of being like God, what do gods do? If I'm God, if I'm now a king, I need a kingdom. If I'm God, I need to rule over something, don't I? What good is it being God if you don't have anything to rule over? And so for Adam and Eve, when they ushered in sin, it gave us a heart that desired to be kingdom builders ourselves. To be kings and lords and masters over our own stuff. You see it? I'm going to make you see it in a minute, even more so. So just hang in there. So, what I want to do is, is pause here for a moment. Because, my friends, 
this one of the most important moments in this whole teaching, because we have to own this. We have to own this, especially as leaders. We have to understand it, and we have to own it, because I hope we can go out and we need to preach this. Because I believe this is a basic understanding of the fallenness and the brokenness and the bondage that, our, that we're all in and that our people are in. And we can't get set free until we understand it and own it for ourselves. So what does it mean to be a second kingdom builder? Well, in scriptural terms, it means that we take certain things in our life, in these four areas of relationship we talked about, and we decide that they are things that we are not going to surrender fully to God, but we're just going to keep control of them ourselves. This is, this is mine. This is back to being an owner. I'm going to claim this for myself. I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to put it in my kingdom. I'm going to set up my throne, and I'm going to rule over some stuff over here because I, I just, I just, I'm not going to give that up. I want to control it. Everything else I'll give to God, but thank you very much. I have my own little kingdom. So, if some of you can relate to that now, you're already going down the road saying, oh boy, what is in my little kingdom? If you can't, then let me help you out a little bit further. What are the things in your life that you know today as you sit here, you've not surrendered them? You, you've not given them up? You still, you still want to hang on to them? I'm giving you a minute to think. Because you've got to name them, don't you? You have to be able to say, yeah, okay. I'll give you a few candidates. Um, money, health, time, career, future, reputation, children, your image, the list could go on and on. I can find several things. I've been preaching, teaching this 17 years, and every time I do, I do a check and I go, yeah, I have kingdom, I have second kingdom issues that I deal with. Because this, is this is a tough thing, isn't it? It's a tough thing. Well, there is, there's an outcome for us as second kingdom builders. First of all, we have to own this. I hope every one of us in this room can say, yes, okay, I am, I got my kingdom. I got my second kingdom. Hope we're all doing that. You don't have to raise your hands. This is not a true confession this time. Oh, we could come forward and do confession, lay hands on you and all the rest. We could all use some of that. But can you name it? Can you see it? Do you admit it? All brothers and sisters together, we're all honest with each other. I got second kingdom issues here. All right. Well, here's the good news. The kingdom that we build as owners rewards us with bondage. It is the absolute reward of being second kingdom people. It is the shock that Adam and Eve had the moment that they fell and all of a sudden looked around and said, oh my goodness, everything has changed. And it's not good. It's not good. Bondage. Bondage. And here's why it's bondage. Because when you and I own something, and we control it, it will become the source. Please listen to me here, because this, this is so important. It becomes the source of our fears, and our anxieties, and our stress, and our discouragement, and our despair. Do you hear that? It's the source of all those things. Let me put it another way. If I'm sitting in my office with my jar of dirt, and I'm feeling a certain sense of stress. I'm looking at a, an email and I'm thinking about a meeting coming up and all of a sudden I'm just, you know, you just start getting all those feelings of, oh my goodness, how's this going to go? What if this goes wrong? There's so much at stake. And you know how the anxiety, am I the only one that does that? Okay, good. Stress and anxiety begins to build up inside of me and I stop for a minute and I say, okay, what's the source? What's the real source of this, this anxiety that I'm feeling, of this fear that I'm feeling? And my friends, when I trace that back to its source, it is always something in my kingdom. Every time. I have never traced it back and found its source in something that I have fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. Right? When we surrender it, we give it up. We're stewards. We're free. 
It's God's to take care of. He's big enough to take care of this. I don't have to worry about it. But when I grab it and take a hold of it and put it in my kingdom and want to control it, then it becomes mine to worry about and stress over. It causes me my anxiety and my distress, my discouragement. You see it? Stuff that we own, we have to protect. We have to build it to be bigger. We have to keep others from getting it. We have to envy people that have more of it. Um, think about your stuff for a minute. Think about the, the physical things in our life. There was a comedian, I don't remember George Carlin, I'm old enough to remember him from a long time ago, but he had this little routine, he talked about stuff. And he said, we spend our whole lives working ourselves to death so that we can buy stuff. Stuff that we can't have enough room for. And he says, and so we get, we get um, storage units to put our stuff in. And when our houses get so full, we can't put anything else in them, we put big blocks on them and we lock the doors so nobody will steal our stuff while we go to the mall to buy more stuff. We get stuffocated. Isn't that a great word? We're just stuffocated with stuff. And the more stuff we have, the more we worry about it, the more we stress over it, the more we try to protect it. it it's the treadmill the enemy has us on when we are second kingdom builders. So if we're willing today to own it, if we can see it and identify it and own it, we have an opportunity to be set free. I, I'll um, just share from just personally, when I think of my second kingdom stuff, one of the ones that I struggle the most with um, is time. It's time. I love to say God owns everything, but man, I like to control my time. I, I like to be able to put my schedule together and when I've got a slot for, for leisure time, when I have something I really want to do, hear the language, that I really want to do with my time, I don't like giving that up. And it's very hard for me to submit my time back, back to the Lord. I think I have time for a story, speaking of time. Here's a little story I learned a while ago. I, I was, um, when I was president at the seminary, there was a, um, a woman who ran a big foundation, which means they had a lot of money. And I was, I, was, I was courting her and meeting with her to get ready to go to them for a big grant for a lot of money for, for the seminary. And of course, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna use my language carefully, I'm a busy person, right? I'm president of a seminary. I'm kind of important, right? And so I set an appointment with her. It was probably the second or third time that I'd gone to meet with her. And we sat down and she gave me like an hour and a half. And she's a delightful lady and I love her dearly, but she talks kind of a lot. And so I came in, sat down, I had my pro pro proposal with me to hand to her. And I think I asked her one question. An hour and a half later, <laughs> we haven't even talked about my proposal. We haven't even talked about the seminary. Cause she's, you know, have you ever, know people like that? Anybody? A couple of people like that? Okay, good, we all know where we at. And, and so she all of a sudden looks at her watch and goes, oh, Scott, I'm so sorry. We haven't even had a chance to talk about the seminary proposal. I got so excited about all this stuff. Let's set another appointment. I said, okay, happy to do that. Let's set another appointment. So I got out my, my day timer. Oh my gosh, did I just age myself? We used to actually keep track of things with a pencil and a piece of paper. Anybody remember that? Come on, who's old enough to remember that? So I had a day timer and I got my pencil out and all that and she looked at hers and like three weeks later we found a slot and all that, put it in my calendar and I thought it was great. Okay, good. Um, and I'm, I'm folding it up and putting my stuff into my briefcase thinking, okay, I can wait three weeks. I'm going to come back. Boy, we're going to nail this thing and we're going to get this thing going. And as I'm putting my stuff away, she says to me, now, Scott, when that day comes, I just want you to know that I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to open up my calendar and I'm going to lay it before the Lord, and I'm going to say to him, Lord, this is what I have planned. What do you have planned? And if he brings something to me that I need to do that day, in place of our meeting, I'm going to have to call you, and we're going to need to reschedule. And I said, oh, I fully understand. I appreciate that. I'm glad that you go to the Lord that way, and if that happens, just let me know. That's no problem. And I gathered up my stuff and said goodbye to her and walked out and punched the elevator button and the door opens up and I got on and the doors closed and I said, oh, come on! Are you kidding me? Who can live like that? It's the silliest thing I've ever heard. How can you, how can you run anything like that? Could you run your business that way or your church that way? Well, you know, if I wake up in the morning, I have to change my whole schedule. I was, I was, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. Um, 
You know, I've come over the years to look back and realize that she was on to something. I mean, she was on to something, wasn't she? Wasn't she? Should we not lay our schedule before the Lord each morning and be willing to say to him, Lord, this, this is what I have planned, but is this your plan for my day? Is this the way you would have me invest the hours that you have given me? This is your time. It's not my time. This is your life. It's not my life. So I just submit it back to you. Guide me, Lord. Guide me, Spirit. Are we willing to do that? It's very hard for me. Um, I was talking to the folks at Frontline that um, when I planned this trip, I specifically came in on Saturday night so I would have all day Sunday to kind of relax. We're at the SIL guest house. I could sit by the pool. I could do a little bit of work. I could get a good night's sleep. And then I'd be ready for you this morning. And my good friend dudes up at Frontline emails me about two months ago. And she said, Scott, would you be willing to come and see our ministry and, and spend two or three hours talking and lecturing to a bunch of pastors and see what all we're doing? It's a two-hour drive from Manila. But I hear you're coming in on Sunday. Could you spend Sunday with us? Well, that was my moment. And my first reaction was to type, no, I'm sorry, I really need to spend the day. And I actually, I've never told her this, I actually had my email halfway typed out. And I stopped and I thought, it's not my time. It's not my time. And when I kind of said sheepishly, I mean, it's one of those prayers, where you, why even pray it? But I prayed it. Lord, what would you have me do with this day that you've given me in Manila? And deleted it and came up and said, love to. Let's plan a time to come out and do it. Because it's God's time. And we had a wonderful day yesterday and I slept well last night and I'm refreshed today and God is faithful. So my friends, what is in your second kingdom that you have not surrendered to him? Let's name it because here's the joy of the fact that one king, when God calls us to be one kingdom people, it sets us free. It just sets us free. So we started out by talking, remember our, our backpacker standing on the edge of the cliff looking out? We talked about the journey of the faithful steward. This is the journey. The journey is to look at ourselves as two kingdom people and ask how God would lead us to shrink our kingdom to submit everything back to him and to live as one kingdom stewards of God. You see it? It's a journey. It doesn't happen all at once and, my, and probably will never fully get there. Although I have met a few people, and maybe you have too, that are pretty darn close. I've been around some people that are about as close to being totally sold out, surrendered, one kingdom followers of Jesus. Um, do you know them? Do you know a few? Boy, hang, hang around with them. Hang out with them. Get to know them. Talk to them about their journey. Because they've been, they've been on this long journey. But that's the journey that God has us on. Every day, He comes to you and to me and says, Are you ready to go further? Are you ready to take off one of those chains that you've been carrying all your life and setting it down and letting me set you free to become a one kingdom, totally surrendered follower of Jesus? It's a journey. It's a journey. I have a, uh, a kind of a mental image of what, again, happens to me every morning. Uh, and this is kind of scary, but I believe this I, with my whole heart. I, I can see it. We all carry different chains in this journey. Um, and I know mine. I know the burdens that I carry. I know the, the, the things that are in my kingdom. And so when I wake up in the morning, you know how you, your mind, it's kind of like you're booting up your computer, isn't it? You know, when you first turn your computer on, everything, everything boots up and all of a sudden all your files are there. Well, your first thing you wake up in the morning, it's like you get this, what, two seconds of bliss and then all the files come. And, and oh, that's right, it's today, I got to do this, I got to do that, oh, that happened yesterday, oh, that person's not, oh, what about that, what, and brr, well, it happened to all of you? We're all there, laying in, laying in bed in the morning. And it's almost like, it's almost like I can see the enemy standing next to my bed, big smile on his face not threatening me at all. He's got a big armload of chains. And he kind of says, well, good morning, Scott. You know what you have ahead of you today. Well, which of these now would you like to wear? Here's the chain of being an owner. You want to put that one on? Here's your second kingdom chain, all those things you like putting here. You want to put that one on? And the next few days, we're going to unpack the other five of them, and I'm going to share them this afternoon with you. And one by one, listen to me now, he offers me the chain to put on myself. The enemy can't put these on us. 
You can just offer them. You ready to take that chain? And some mornings, I, by the time my feet hit the floor, I've got four chains wrapped around me. And I slink my way into the bathroom to brush my teeth, thinking, wow, this is going to be a tough day. This is going to be a hard day. Well, yeah, it's going to be a hard day. But the good thing is, is that the Holy Spirit's in the same room. And the Holy Spirit is saying to us, Scott, you want to be set free? Are you ready today to take that chain you've been wearing for the last 10 years and drop it? And letting me set you free to be the child of God I created you to be? And that's my choice. Do I take the chain or do I walk with Jesus down my journey of being a more faithful steward and accepting the freedom he has for us? It's just that clear. It's just that simple. For those of you that are pastors, I think every Sunday you look out on a congregation of people that are in bondage. They have chains. They put them on every morning. They accept them as what it means just part of life. They're, they have fear and anxiety and stress and concerns, don't they? And what are we doing as pastors to help them be set free? I would say the greatest single thing you can do as a pastor to set your people free is to be set free yourself. Be on that journey and then invite them with you. That's all I'm really doing here today. I'm just inviting you to be on this journey that I've been on and that all of us are on that God might, through the power of His Spirit, set us free. Does that make sense? We okay? All right. So this is the battle that we face. It's a battle of submission or control. Are we really going to submit or are we going to continue to try to keep control? It's a battle of freedom or bondage. It's a battle of being a steward or an owner. And you know, my friends, in the end, what this really comes down to is it's all about lordship, isn't it? Who is ultimately Lord of every area of your life? Who is the Lord? The less it's us, the more it's God, the more we know the peace and the joy. So, this is not a destination, but a journey of transformation. It is the journey of the faithful steward. And then these four spheres, and I'm going to draw a little map for you here and show you where we're going. Because we're going to look at oops, sorry, relationship in all four of these areas. Um, we're going to look at our relationship with God and what does it mean to be a faithful steward in God's presence. And, as I'll introduce this afternoon, what does it mean to be a steward leader in that same sphere? Our relationship with ourselves, we talk about it, the leader in the mirror. This is the leader in relationship and the leader, uh, steward leader in God's creation. So what I want to propose to you, and again, this is, we'll see this after lunch more clearly, but what I want to propose to you is this. If, if you're with me so far this morning in, in saying that all of us are on this journey and we're becoming more faithful stewards, what happens when God calls you into a role of leadership. Does the journey that we're on in our personal life impact the way we lead? And I'm going to say a resounding yes. I think it changes everything. We now come into a leadership role with the lenses of a steward on a journey. And I think we look at the way we lead in a very, very different way. That's really where the whole steward leader came from. It started back in 2000 when we wrote Stewards in the Kingdom and we wrote the theology. This is it. And this is not all of it, but this is the, the foundation of it are these two understandings and this journey that we're on to become one kingdom people. And as we unpacked it in lots of different ways, InterVarsity came back and said, what, do you think this has any impact or implications for leadership? I said, yeah, I think it has huge implications for leadership. And so we took the theology and applied it to the role of being a leader and realized that in every one of these areas, the way in which we lead changes if we see our role as a steward and not as an owner. So more to come this afternoon, but I wanted to make that, that little shift here. And this is kind of what it looks like, the leader in all four of these roles um, in being faithful to what God called us to. And so I'm going to come back to the personal. We're going to end with this. This is not quite an altar call, um, but if you want to come and, like I said, we'll come and, and do one here. We're all for that. 
But, um, but we've, got to, we've got to own this personally before we can do it in our leadership. So here we go. This is the invitation that Scripture has for us. And these are just a few of the passages. If you look through Scripture and look at what God talks about in Jesus in terms of freedom, well, we know these, don't we? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I love this. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Paul and Corinthians, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And finally, in Galatians, he's trying so hard to get the point across. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You know, one of the victories of the enemy is when one day we finally take one of these chains off and let it fall, and then a few days later, he gets us to pick it up again, right? It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't let yourselves be yoked again by a burden of slavery. And so, what do we mean by the faithful steward? Just a few comments here as we close. A faithful steward is a follower of Jesus Christ who's been set free to live as a one kingdom person in every area of life. There's this twofold character of what it means to be a faithful steward. The first is that we're, we're set free to live the way we're supposed to live. And the second is we respond with joyful obedience. When, when people you know, get asked by marketing people, um, can you in one little sentence say what it is you do with this whole steward's journey? The, way, the name of our organization is called The Steward's Journey. No surprise, right? Um, what is that really all about? Can you, can you just give it to me in like a pithy little comment? And if you go to our website, you'll see that it's the big words that are right on the very top of the website. It's freedom and joy. It's freedom and it's joy. And why is it freedom and joy? Because we believe that most Christians are living in bondage and discouragement. Freedom and joy. And that's the, the outcome. So think about this on all four levels. <clears throat> in our relationship with God, when we are freed in our relationship to God to steward it, we get to respond joyfully with worship and praise and devotion. I just pray that when you think about being stewards of that relationship with God, that your, your time in church together, in worship, your personal devotions, everything that you do will just be filled with more joy and freedom because you're stewards of this wonderful relationship. In our relationship with ourselves, when we're freed there, we respond joyfully by keeping our self-image in balance. And I'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon. And those of you who are continuing on, as I said, this is like a big section tomorrow morning. Um, but there's a sense that now I can, I can steward my self-image and understand it. When we're set free in our relationship to our neighbor, that third level, I can respond joyfully by loving my neighbor as ends. And if you don't know what, quite that, what, what that means, then that, that'll bring you back this afternoon, see? You can go home not knowing. You can't go home now. You've got to come back this afternoon. I'll explain that to you. And finally, free in our relationship to creation, it means responding joyfully by caring for God's creation. And that includes not only the environment, it includes our time, our talents, and all of our resources. Everything that God has made available to us at our disposal. So you can see that when one sets us free, the other calls us to a joyful, obedient response. That's the life that God calls us to. So the question is, do you want to be free? Well, welcome to the journey. I'm going to close this by doing two things. I have a prayer that if you feel like the Lord has led you to this point, uh, we can pray it together, and then I want to just show you briefly the steward of life plan for this section, and then we'll break for, for lunch. And I, you know, I have, I've rambled on so much, I haven't even asked for questions, I'm sorry. I get so excited about this stuff. Um, but we can, at the end, we'll, have, we'll take questions, we'll have chat a little bit, we have a few minutes here for it. But if you would, let's read, uh, read this prayer together out loud, can we? Lord, we are all second kingdom builders. We confess to you our kingdom building ways. We are all in bondage to worldly things. We pray to you to set us free. We submit everything we have and everything we are to the Lordship of your one gracious kingdom. Help us to serve only you with obedience and joy. In the name of the one who came to set us free, Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.